Hi, this is Ann Greiner, President and CEO of the Patient Center Primary Care Collaborative. Good afternoon and welcome to our February web webinar, Overcoming Challenges to Ideal Primary Care. We're so glad that so many of you could join us this afternoon for this very important discussion with uh, physicians uh, representing their practices and other clinicians um, from uh, Florida in an academic medical center, Dr. Christopher uh, Scuderi, and Dr. Jason Hill, who practices in Oklahoma uh, at a, um, a family medicine practice in the uh, Choctaw National Health Services Authority. So thanks again um, for joining us. Um, before we begin, I um, wanted to provide some updates uh, with respect to the PCPCC and just give you a sense of how the webinar is going to unfold. Um, first, uh, to let you know that we have our next webinar scheduled for March 27th, Trans Transforming Clinical Practice by Supporting Patient and Family decision making and for that webinar um, we'll lead off with Marilyn Francis who's the project director of the PCPCC uh, effort within the CMMI grant um, transforming clinical practice initiative and she'll be joined by Dan Wilson who's the executive vice president at the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation along with uh, Wendy Nichols from the American College of Physicians. Uh, we also will be including um, someone from a patient or consumer organization to round out the panel, and they'll be discussing our work uh, within the CMMI grant to bring patient and family engagement um, tools and education, and also um, uh, we'll be integrating patient and family engagement into the Choosing Wisely campaign, which is why we've invited Dan Wilson to participate in that webinar. So please uh, register for it if you have not yet. Um, I also wanted to bring you up to date on our policy agenda. The PCPCC board has set our agenda for the years ahead, for the three remaining years of the current administration. Of course, each year we'll examine um, our policy agenda and make any uh, mid-course corrections, but what we're focused on with respect to our policy is really um, addressing um, the lack of alignment between our uh, reform agenda with respect to primary care and our agenda with respect to payment reform. Um, in the last decade, I think you can all agree, we've made a lot of strides to reform the way we deliver primary care. Um, through the patient center medical home and other advanced models of primary care. However, um, payment uh, has not been reformed to the same extent. We're largely still um, focused on a fee-for-service system, which doesn't really um, allow us practitioners to truly transform care. And so our focus um, over the next number of years will be on how do we um, uh, get more investment into primary care, uh, more investment into alternative payment models? And um, we'll go about that by really focusing on a standardized measure of primary care investment or spend um, so that we can compare um, integrated delivery systems and HCOs and health plans to each other as well as states with respect to what they're investing in primary care. Um, and then working with states who have put um, in place either through regulation or legislation efforts to increase as much as double the investment in primary care uh, uh, spend with those additional monies going into alternative payment models. So that's policy priority number one. Policy priority number two is to address the financial barriers that exist um, for many patients in, in getting primary care services. In many cases, patients have um, insurance, but um, high deductibles and high co-pays and other barriers really um, get in the way of them accessing those services. So we'll be working 
with innovative um, employers and payers who understand that um, that really doesn't make sense, that we want to give people access to high value primary care uh, upstream so that we can um, keep the American public healthy and they don't need to um, wait to get care and then um, you know be sicker <laughs> later on and um, for, for all of that to be more costly to the system. So those really are our two primary policy agendas um, for the years ahead. Years ahead, we'll also be focusing on a set of programmatic priorities, um, including embedding uh, behavioral health into primary care. Um, if any of you on the line are not um, executive members, um, we encourage you to become an executive member. You can um, check out our membership benefits on our website or email Allison Gross directly and um, she can provide additional information. Um, with respect to today's webinar, we ask that you use the chat box. We have um, hundreds and hundreds of people on this webinar and so we can't open up the phone lines, but please just put your question into the chat box. If it's directed to one or other of the speakers, you should let us know that as well. Um, so without further ado, and oh, I should say, I'm gonna introduce um, our two speakers. They're gonna speak um, one after the other, and then um, we will open it up for questions. Um, and um, we just blew by the, um, shared principles slide, but let me just mention that for a moment. Um, for those of you who regularly tune in to PCPCC webinars and have been following um, organizational activities over the last six months, you know that we released a new vision for primary care called the Shared Principles of Primary Care. It updates what we released in 2007, the Joint Principles for the Patient Center Medical Home. And these were developed um, uh, through a lot of work across all stakeholders in healthcare to get input into this new vision for primary care. They were developed in partnership with FMA Health um, over the course of about a year and a half and released at our conference in October. Um, you can see the icons that represent the seven principles of primary care. Um, there are a number of principles that really are constant and um, recognizable for uh, from 2007, but there are also um, some principles that either have uh, that are new um, or that really have been updated. So let me start with patient and family centered. I think um, over the last decade, we've recognized the important role that patients and families can play in terms of contributing um, to restoring their health or keeping themselves healthy. And so there's a much more robust definition of patient and family centered care in these principles. Also, um, there's a focus on the team. The team was always a part of it, but there's an even more of a focus on team-based care. We've certainly seen that evolution over the last decade. Um, there's also a, a notion about equitable care, which um, is linked to comprehensiveness. But this view of um, uh, primary care as a very important actor in the healthcare system to be addressing the social determinants of health, and we know now how much those contribute to health outcomes. And finally, a focus on value um, and an acknowledgement that everybody in the healthcare system has a role to play in stewarding scarce res resources. Now let me introduce our two speakers. Um, Dr. Christopher, Christopher Sudari um, uh, is a, a doctor of osteopathic medicine, a family medicine specialist in Jacksonville, Florida. He graduated from Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine in 2002 specializes in family medicine, diabetes medicine, and much more. Since 2009, he's been the medical director and associate professor for community health and family medicine at the University of Florida, New Berlin Family Medicine and Pediatrics. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill, for joining us today. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Suderi, for joining us today. Dr. Jason Hill was born and raised in and around Muskegee, Oklahoma, and after he graduated from Northeastern State University, he had a very uh, 
uh, varied career path. Um, he has been a carpenter. He was in the U.S. Army. He was a high school science teacher and a medical office manager. He actually went to medical school nine years after graduating from college. So he had a, uh, many careers before he decided to pursue medicine. He finished his residency in family medicine at Oklahoma State University Family Medicine Residency in 2002. As I mentioned at the top of the hour, he practices family medicine at the Choctaw National Health Services Authority, and he's been there since 2002. And he's and since that time, he's held various positions, including Family Medicine Service Chief, Chief of Medicine, Chief of Staff, and he currently serves as the Chief Medical Officer, Director of Medical Education, and Family Medicine Res Residency Program Director uh, for Choctaw National Health Services Authority. Okay, I think we are going to start our programming today with Dr. Scuderi. Let me turn the baton over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Thank Ed, you. for the introduction. And uh, one second here and see if we can advance here. And, Oh, sorry about that. So we just uh, so and thank you for the uh, introduction. And uh, I'd like to share a little bit about some of the work that we've done down here in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, got three objectives this afternoon over the next uh, 15 minutes. Uh, the first is to re review our current practice and some of the growth that we've achieved. The second is to review how meeting the PCPCC's shared principles benefits our practice and our patients. And the third is to identify my three biggest challenges to optimal care. And uh, I think that, you know, they're pretty common across the country. Our practice is UF Health Family Medicine and Pediatrics, New Berlin, and it was established in July 2009. Uh, the first day we started, it was me, an office manager, and two CSR slash MAs. We had 11 patients. We thought it was a great success. Uh, the practice was established in a growing area of North Jacksonville, um, very close to Jacksonville International Airport. And it's part of the UF Health Network, which is part of the safety net um, for Northeast Florida. Uh, it's a rotation site for third year students from UF College of Medicine, Gainesville, fourth year students from LeCom, Bradenton, and residents from the St. Vincent Family Medicine Residency, which is here in Jacksonville. Nine years later, a lot has changed. Our practice is, is very different. And so we've grown now to six providers in two buildings. Uh, we're up to four physicians. We have three family medicine physicians, one pediatrician. We have two nurse practitioners, one registered nurse. We have a part-time licensed clinical social worker and a uh, nurse care coordinator, and we're up to over 20 staff. And so it, it's been an amazing change just, just in nine years. And um, we've been a uh, patient center medical home since 2011, and we've been a level three patient center medical home since 2014. And I think a lot of our evolution has been how do we become a patient med center medical home in spirit, not just on paper, and so we've been working towards that. A large part of the success I think that we've had has been related to just an emphasis on team-based care. And we try to make that a foundation of just our practice um, from its early days, and it's, it's really helped us as we've evolved with all the challenges that primary care brings. And we had over 20,000 visits in our past year, so it's, it's grown quickly. Our demographics here in Jacksonville at our practice is uh, we have almost 48% commercial um, and HMO patients, 25% Medicare, 14% TRICARE, 7% Medicaid, and 5% self-pay. And this is very different than the demographics of our system as a whole, being a safety net system. And so our clinic has one of the highest commercial populations um, because of our location. And this helps. Um, you know, just to strengthen our, our, our hospital and our system as a whole. And so we've really tried to, to provide a great service out here in the, the north side Jacksonville. And so at this point, I'd like to switch gears and talk about how the principles of um, the PCPCC have helped our practice. And the first one I want to look at is person and family centered care. And so to try to address this, we've added a part-time licensed clinical social worker and care coordinator. Um, the licensed clinical social worker works um, a day and a half per week in our office, and the care coordinator works one day, but also works remotely to support us during the rest of the week. A big part of what we've done to try to work with our community is we've provided a lot of community education. We help write a monthly article for our local newspaper, the North Jacks Monthly, and we started doing this about six years ago. It's been very, very popular with our patients and our community as a whole. Um, each of the providers here in the practice take turns writing the article, and we try to make it you know, something that's relevant to the time. 
One of the other things that we've done that's been very successful is we have an annual patient appreciation party just to tell our patients thank you. And this year it's evolved into a health fair. And so we had a number of specialists from our community come provide screenings and lectures, and it was very well received by our patients and community. We also try to participate in many local speaking events to try to you know, help make sure that our population in North Jacksonville is as healthy as it could be. We also try to pay close attention to our patient surveys, and UF Health here in Jacksonville is partnered with Sullivan Llewellyn, and in the past six months, we've had over 500 patient surveys for our practice. 97.1% um, of our practice would recommend, uh, patients would recommend our clinic, and 99.3% of our patients felt that their care is good or better, and so we try to review this data almost weekly to see what our patients are saying about our practice, how they feel their care is, and what areas we can improve. A big part of this, too, is having a service recovery plan for when a patient has a bad experience. And so our office manager, you know, contacts those patients, reaches out to them, and makes sure that, you know, we can, you know, try all we can to, to make the situation better for that patient. And so this is this has worked real well, especially on opportunities where the patient's been frustrated, to try to make it for an opportunity to build trust and to, you know, really remedy the situation. And so it's been very helpful to have these surveys and to see how the patients feel our practice is doing. The next principle that you know, we, we worked towards was continuous care. And so in 2013, um, we added a second building to our practice, which was a pediatric office. And this helped bring a, a whole new group of patients to us. And then we've tried to, been, to, to work as a pioneer in our, in our system for both Medicare annual wellness visits and transitional care visits. Um, David Cox, our nurse care coordinator, has been doing a great job with these. And um, the Medicare annual wellness visits have really um, been, been very popular with our Medicare patients. And they really enjoy being able to spend an hour with David. And then David reports back to the primary care physicians to let them know just what was found at those visits and way that we can optimize those patients' health. We've also worked hard to um, be a pioneer in our system with the transitional care visits. And David reaches out to our patients who've been hospitalized within 48 hours um, to try to contact the patients, see if they have any needs um, if they're able to get all their medications, and then also to schedule them an appointment within seven to 14 days with our practice. Um, the patients have been very happy with these calls and with these visits, and we hope it's preventing readmissions. And so I think it's been a great service to our patients by doing this. The next principle that we work towards is comprehensive and equitable care. And as I mentioned earlier, we've been a uh, level three patient center medical home since 2014. And I think a big part of, of our medical home and being able to prevent comprehensive care has been our move to EPIC. Uh, we moved to EPIC in the summer of 2014 as our EHR. And if you would have asked me what I felt about EPIC that summer, uh, I probably would have had a very different conversation. <laughs> it was frustrating at the time, but it, it truly has been a great system for us. Uh, we've been able to um, see just our patients who are inpatients in the UF Health Network. I can follow their, their care while they're an inpatient. I can see my patients while they're in the ER. When I come in each morning, I'm able to review a list of all my patients who've been in the ER that night and we're able to contact them. And I think it's really just helped us to, to see what's going on beyond our patient visit. Two years ago, we also received um, Healthy Planet, which is Epic's population management software. And, and that's also been a great tool for us to help us to work on chronic disease management. And these registries have, have really helped us to improve our care for our diabetics and to uh, make sure their patients are meeting their preventative goals. And so this has been a, a great addition. Two years ago, we received a grant from our local American Cancer Society here in Jacksonville, and this was to improve our rates of colorectal cancer screening. Um, these grants have helped us to educate our staff on the importance of colorectal screening. And then we've also been able to get fit tests in the office kits from all three of our uh, major labs. And so that way patients who have um, refused colonoscopy screening are able to pick up an alternative right at the time of their visit. And it's been very popular with our patients and um, has helped with the colorectal screening statistics. And I think is really, um, you know, motivate our staff to really attack colorectal cancer screening. In 2009, 2010, 2011, uh, we participated in Dr. Ed Shahidi's Diabetes, Mas Diabetes Master Clinician Program. And this really gave us a great foundation to help us to understand the importance of team-based care, and then also to understand the importance of using registries for chronic diseases. Um, that registry that we used um, before we had Healthy Planet was fantastic to train our staff about the importance of 
registries and how to reach patients beyond the, the 15, 20 minute visit for their diabetes. And I think it really helped to set us on a great course early on in our practice. And our goal for this year is we're hoping to build a survey for social determinants of health in our system that the patients can do uh, via tablet or at home before they come in for a visit. That way that the provider can review it with them at their visit and to, to make sure this is, is part of the uh, patient's um, information when um, it's reviewed at their visit. The next principle that we we'll work towards is team-based and collaborative care. And this is my passion. This is the area that I really think that we can make a huge difference in primary care. Um, you know, we received a grant uh, three years ago from the University of Florida to study team-based care. And we published these results in the uh, November 2017 Osteopathic Family Physician. And uh, you know, really looked at the importance of servant leadership in driving team-based care. It's, it's such an important key. And we need servant leaders and physicians and administrators to really take the lead and to make sure that the, they're, they're taking a team-based approach to attacking the challenges that we face here in primary care. And it's important that, you know, with our staff, that there's a couple principles that we work with them for. The first is to have a defined mission. We have a very clear mission statement. Um, one of our staff made a sign that sits in our waiting room. So our patients and our staff know exactly what we're about every day. The second thing that's important is to establish clear roles for your staff. They need to understand what their job is each day. The MAs need to know what exactly the physicians expect for them to participate to take better care of patients. It's then important to make sure that we're meeting with our staff at least monthly, and we try to meet as a staff monthly and provide them education. And during these meetings, we try to give them an equal voice. I'd say 90% of the innovation that's taking place in our clinic has been from our staff. And so we want to make sure that we're looking towards them to see what can we do better? How can we provide better care to our patients? And it's amazing some of the great ideas that our staff has come from. The other thing that we've learned that really works well is collaborative learning. You know, you have some superstars in the clinic, and so if they're doing great work, make sure they're teaching the other, the other, uh, the other staff and the, also the providers the great work that they're doing and some of the shortcuts they're finding and so that we can provide better care. And a big thing that, you know, we've learned over the past couple of years is as we're moving to team-based care, and as, as you know, we're asking more, more and more of our staff, how do we reward them? You know, how do we make sure that they understand we appreciate the, the job that they're doing day in and day out? And so some of the things that we've done down here in Jacksonville, one is we've created a morale fund. And if the clinic's been successful, we try to make sure that there's funds left over that we can do some exciting events with the staff. And so last month we took them to brunch and we took them to uh, an art class. This month we're going to an escape room. Uh, we've hired a masseuse in the clinic a couple of times. We've had beach parties, we've gotten Jaguars games. And it really has made a big difference because you know the staff is working very, very, very hard. And so we wanna make sure that we appreciate them. The other thing is we move to share savings plans, and as there's opportunities that the clinics become profitable, we need to make sure that the staff also benefits from that. So you can see here's my staff here, and uh, we were excited. This was the uh, Friday right before the Jaguars played the uh, Patriots in the uh, AFC Championship game, so we had a great season down here, so we're excited for next season, so it was good, it was good to, to do that, but here's our staff. Our next principle is coordinated and integrated care. And one of the ways that we've tried to address this is to really get our patients to use the My UF Health app. And we've gotten almost 70% of our patients to participate. One of our providers has 87% of their patients participating on this app. And this app allows the patients to get their results typically within 24 to 48 hours, contact us via email if they have any questions or concerns, make appointments, and do medication refills. And so it's, it's been a really great asset to us I think has really helped with patient satisfaction. The other thing that we've tried to do is we try to make sure that we partner with other, other groups to, to improve our care in our office. Um, we have had a partnership with UF Gainesville and we've tried to develop the robust health maintenance module in EPIC to make sure that we're um, addressing all the preventative cares and chronic disease uh, care that's needed. And this has really helped us, especially, you know, you have patients that are coming in for a sore throat that you may see once every five years to make sure that we're seeing what gaps in care are, are there for those patients. The other thing that we try to do locally is participate in a couple committees here in our Jacksonville UF Health Campus to improve patient care. Uh, one's been the Ambulatory Performance Improvement Committee and the other has been the Patient Advocacy Committee. 
And there's so much we can learn from our other providers. You know, what happens so often in primary care is you're seeing 25 patients day in and day out that you miss, you miss the opportunity to learn from those who are doing great work. And so it's important that we take time to learn you know, from those around us because everyone's doing great work out there and there's, there's some you know, best practices that we can learn from. We need to take time and see what's working and what's not working around us. And our system's fully integrated with the UF Health North, which is our local hospital and greater UF system throughout Northeast Florida. The next principle that we worked towards was trying to make care accessible. And uh, we did this by trying to use innovative scheduling. Um, we start with a 7.20 a.m. first appointment. And then three years ago, we added evening provider. Uh, one of our physicians works 12 to eight, Monday through Thursday. And this has been very popular, especially with the staff of our hospital that they've been able to get in after hours and receive care. A um, Couple years ago, we moved to online scheduling. And then one of the things that we've done that's been very successful is we have a number of PRN providers. Uh, they're both PAs um, that help assist us. If one of our providers is out on vacation or is out sick, they're able to come in and see urgent patients that day. And so our patients are still able to get care even if their provider's out. And this has been very popular with our patients. Here at U of Health in Jacksonville, we have a central call center. And we realized over the past couple of years that patients you know, they were open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. during our typical working hours, and we realized that the patients wanted more access, and so they've expanded their hours over the past year, and they now open up at 7 a.m., and they're open to 10 p.m., and this has been very popular with the patients. Um, they've also hired two triage nurses who are able to escalate any concerns to a higher level if needed, and also, you know, give basic medical advice if needed, too, and, and this has been very successful for our system over the, the past year. I think one of the most important things when you look at accessibility is, is discussing with your patients, how do you navigate our system? And this is a conversation I try to have with each of my patients when they come in as a new patient. You know, what are the best ways to navigate us? If you have trouble getting a, a, an appointment by phone, what are some other avenues to reach us? You know, how do you communicate with us when you need something urgently? And I think if you set those expectations early on and that patients know, um, you know, it really helps with patient satisfaction. And when a patient needs something urgently, they know which way to turn. So I think it's very important to, you know, to teach our providers to, you know, really set that um, tone for the first time they see a patient. And the last principle that we work towards is high value care. And as I mentioned, we've been a level three patient center medical home since 2014, and we're constantly looking at how can we be a greater medical home in spirit? How can we, you know, just continue to advance this concept? Uh, we have a 4.05 star rating uh, from Humana for HEDIS uh, star rating uh, last year, and uh, we participate in an accountable care organization with Blue Cross Blue Shield. One of the things that we've done here in Jacksonville that's helped with this is we have a centrally located value-based funding team that works with the 30 outpatient clinics, and this is a group of four or five people that help work through the registries to see if there's any large gaps in care and remotely um, help address them and work with the providers to make sure that, you know, the patients such as the diabetic patients are, are having their annual eye exams. And so it's, it's been a, a great tool to have an extra group to, to assist you beyond the patient visit. And then, as I mentioned before, Healthy Plan has been a very, very good tool for us. We in the office have a monthly meeting to review our scores and to see how we're doing and what areas we're improving in or what areas we're falling behind from. And it's important during those meetings that we teach our staff exactly why we do what we do. You know, as we're trying to improve our rates of Prevnar 13 vaccination, it's important that our staff understands exactly what is Prevnar 13 and why do we want to give it into which patients. And so they have to understand what we're doing so that way they're able to talk to the patients at their visit, why Dr. Scuderi is going to recommend that you get this, this vaccination. The other thing that we try to do with the staff is share patient testimonials, you know, especially with the colorectal screening project. You know, there's been a number of patients that we've caught, you know, early colorectal cancer on and that they've been very grateful that they had screening. And so we want to make sure that the staff gets motivated, that they realize that they're not just doing clicks and that they're not just, you know, checking off boxes, that we're really affecting patients' lives. We're affecting families. We're making a difference by, you know, working to, to improve patient care. And so in my last couple of minutes here, I just want to shift gears and talk about a couple of challenges that we're facing now in primary care. Um, these, you know, I'm sure are common um, throughout the country. And, and the first is our EHRs aren't fully optimized. And, and, you know, one of my biggest frustrations here in Jacksonville is we have five healthcare systems and it's so difficult to share data. We have all these amazing EHRs and, and they do not communicate. Um, 
you know, one of the biggest issues now is, you know, as we're trying to improve our scores for macro, you know, many of our patients have their annual eye exam outside of our system. And so then our staff has to get that faxed in, they have to scan into our system, and then they have to manually go in and result what day the patient had their visit in, in, in a proper way. And it takes time. And this should be something that auto populates. Health, you know, hospital discharges are another area. Um, I had a patient a couple weeks ago that was, you know, had a hospitalization that won the hospitals here in Jacksonville. It took me over two weeks to get the discharge summary, even though, you know, we sent multiple releases. And so it was very, very frustrating to pick up on that patient's care. And then it was similar with the colonoscopy study. Um, you know, our largest uh, GI group in town is an independent group, and it, it's very difficult. You know, we have to wait for the faxes to come in, and then we have to go in and manually update um, their next screening um, time that they need their next colonoscopy. And so the more we could push to get our EHRs to communicate, um, the safer it's going to be for our patients and, and the better care we're going to provide. And then we need to work with our EHRs to make sure that there's more artificial intelligence. You know, just, I think everyone's tired. There's too many clicks. You know, we just keep, you know, having all these workarounds put in that they're asking us to do more and more clicks. And so we need to make sure that the EHRs are helping us to take care of our patients, that they're, you know, assisting us and saying, hey, did you recognize this patient's blood pressure is very high today? Or this patient's had a, a weight loss, you know, things that can help us to provide good care. You know, often I'm going to the room now and there's about 15 clicks and things I have to get through before I even get to the reason why Mrs. Smith is here to see me. And so it, it, it sometimes can be very distracting. And so we have to, as we try to provide comprehensive care every time we see patients, we need the HRs to, to really continue to grow and help us to practice. The second challenge is, is one that's near dear to me and one we're, we're starting to study here at U of Health in Jacksonville, and that's the lack of reimbursement for work outside the patient visits. Now, if I look at just how much work's being done, this is my typical day. I'm spending two hours beyond each weekday, beyond patient visits, doing work. You know, there's over 30 medication refills. There's over 25 MyChart messages each day, which is our email portal. We had 1,000 messages from that portal in the month of January. Um, you know, there's 10 phone calls, 15 charts that need action or follow-up. You know, there's 15 to 20 nurse practitioner charts I need to sign off on and over 30 results. And so this is a lot of work um, that's being done. And, and this bleeds into our weekends. This bleeds into our evenings. And this is beyond, you know, the patients that we're seeing, you know, for eight or nine hours each day, too. And if we're looking at how do we make family medicine a primary care viable option for medical students, we need to look at how do we prevent burnout and how do we find reimbursement for this work that's being done? Because this is where great medical work is being done. You know, it's, it's the follow-up. It's the, the calling patients. It's the communication. This is what makes great primary care. And a lot of this is work that's being done outside of the patient visit. And so we need to get creative on how we address this as we go forward, because this is a, a critical, critical issue right now. We're seeing you know, the rates of burnout in primary care are over 50%. And we need great family docs. We need great young family docs. And we need to make it a, you know, just a, a viable option for our students. And so this, this is one that we need to continue to work through. And the last challenge that we're facing, you know, and, and this is one down here, is retaining staff in a thriving economy. You know, in Jacksonville, there's five healthcare systems. It's very, very, very um, uh, competitive um, for hiring staff. Unfortunately, now there's only one MA school in all of Jacksonville for this big city. And so there's, there's very few MA students coming through. And so, you know, you're seeing less and less applicants for these positions. And so as we move to team-based care and as we move to you know, looking at how do we include our staff to take better care of our patients. This is a giant challenge. We need to have great, great staff to help us, you know, what uh, our staff make or break us. And so it's important, you know, we as, you know, providers and medical directors and administrators make sure we take great care of our staff. We recognize the work that they're doing, but then we also need to look at how do we have a pipeline of great staff coming in and innovative ways to make sure that we're training great MAs in the future. And I just want to just thank you for, for letting me uh, share some, some of our uh, experiences here in Jacksonville. Here's my email if you have uh, you know, any questions beyond, beyond the, uh, the, the chat later on. Um, I'd like to quote with the, uh, just end this presentation with a great quote I saw from a uh, Olympic kayaker from Canada. Her name is Anna Levescu. And she said to enhance the stability in rapids when you're kayaking, it's important to move as fast or faster than the current. Every time you rudder or drag your paddle in the water or steer, 
you lose momentum and that makes you vulnerable to flipping over. And you know, if you look at the current state of where we are in primary care, you know, the water is moving very quickly and we're in the rapids. And so it's important that we as a group advocate and innovate together to get through these rapids and make sure that we're moving fast enough, that we're taking the best care of our patients and helping our colleagues to, to stay healthy and, and to continue to do this in a great way. And so thank you again for this, this, this time to share with you. And at this point, we're gonna turn the presentation over to Dr. Hill. Okay, thank you, Dr. Scuderi, and uh, I, uh, interesting presentation. Uh, also, thank you, Ann, for your kind introduction earlier. Uh, we're gonna move over here. We're in Oklahoma, so I'm gonna talk to you from Choctaw Nation Health Services Authority. Uh, which is run by the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. We are the uh, third largest federally recognized Native American tribe in the United States. Just a bit of quick history is the, the Choctaw Nation uh, were uh, forcibly relocated from the Mississippi area of the United States to uh, present day to uh, what is now um, Southeast Oklahoma at the time it was Indian Territory. Currently there's about 250,000 uh, Choctaw uh, Indians uh, worldwide, about 80,000 live in Oklahoma. Uh, the tribe compacted with the, uh, I'm gonna back up one slide here. The uh, Choctaw Nation tribe compacted with the Indian Health Service in 1995 to be solely responsible for managing all the aspects of their healthcare delivery system. Uh, what that means is we, uh, we do every bit of care um, that you could have for your health, including uh, primary care, dental, uh, optometry, podiatry, specialty services, pharmacy, labs, and x-ray. Um, we uh, no longer uh, let the Indian Health Service run that for us, but we do that ourselves. We take the funding that Indian Health Service would normally um, um, provide for that and then we augment that by um, pri charging private insurance, Medicare and Medicaid for those that have uh, those payer sources. And we uh, have our health system. In our health system, I have our payer mix there, which is about 55% of our patients have no payer source. And that's because uh, the Native Americans are one group of people who are not required by the, were not required by the Affordable Care Act to have insurance because they had uh, Indian Health Service uh, benefits. So currently in our system, we see about 900 primary care visits per day. Uh, we have one hospital with 37 beds in Tallahassee, Oklahoma. We have nine satellite clinics and each clinic is a standalone unit, uh, which can fully develop, deliver their uh, health to their teams. We have one ambulatory surgery center, about 1600 full-time employees, and we do around 500 deliveries uh, per year. Here's a picture of our, um, uh, overhead of our hospital that's in Tallahassee, Oklahoma, which is in the mountains of Southeast Oklahoma. Um, one of the things that I was asked to talk about was some success, success stories and then your challenges. And so our, uh, probably our biggest challenge uh, is the fact that we're in such a uh, remote and isolated part of the United States where it's literally um, more than 100 miles between some of our clinics, um, more than 50 miles between grocery stores. So what do you do to recruit physicians to, to such remote areas? And also, how do you uh, recruit other licensed staff? Then there's just the logistics of uh, driving between 50 and 100 miles to your, uh, either to your, from home to work or from home to your doctor's office. And then there's also the regulatory burden. Uh, we have the same, uh, we're Joint Commission accredited. We have the same uh, requirements for quality monitoring as any other health system. And how do you do that? Uh, and that's at our, among our top challenges. Uh, so here's a picture, it's got a, just a, a box around the, the region of Oklahoma. And I like this slide because in this particular slide, uh, you might notice it doesn't have any cities. So it's a very uh, sparsely populated part of the state. So among our, some of our biggest success stories is gonna be our, uh, we realized early on that uh, because of our remote location, we needed um, a steady pipeline of uh, good, well-trained physicians. And we had the opportunity to, uh, through the uh, HRSA grant 
to have a uh, teaching health center. And so we developed our own family medicine residency in 2012. We're accredited initially by the AOA, and now we're also accredited by ACGME for up to 12 residents. We graduated our first class in 2015, and we've been able to hire 80% of our graduates to come work in our more remote locations. Uh, some of the things we found out we had to have uh, in order to have residents is uh, because of the remoteness of our um, system, there was not even, even housing for our residents. So we had to actually build nine uh, homes for our residents, which we did. We also had to develop student housing uh, where we can have medical students come through and rotate for their uh, different rotation requirements for medical schools. And so we invested in uh, student housing as well. Uh, so one of the things that we found in order to be to attract residents and medical students is we had to have we had to have a concept of being academically friendly. Initially, when we uh, started this program, we found out that there were actually policies in place that kept um, students from being able to shadow or rotate uh, due to some Indian health child uh, laws or policies. So we had to go back and rewrite several policies to uh, to make it possible to take shadowers and students. And we just wanted to have a mindset that viewed our local students as our most precious, valuable resource. And we wanted to attract them to our system. That started in, in um, with high schools. We go out to our high schools and encourage them to come to our hospital on a, on a high school senior day. We, uh, we do lectures in those high schools for various science classes. Uh, we, our high school senior day, we bring the seniors in and let them look at the different licensed professions within the system since we're the largest employer in this part of the state. Uh, we let them look at, we have, we give them coupons that tell them the uh, education level and the starting salary of every position from a scrub tech to a pharmacist to a physician and uh, have presentations for them. Uh, we also uh, do presentations for the pre-med clubs at some of the colleges in the state. We always bring pizza, and then we allow shadowing experiences uh, that can be coordinated through our medical staff office. Then finally, in medical schools, we uh, make sure that some of our physicians are asked to be lecturers at uh, different presentations at the medical school. Once again, we always bring pizza. We offer core rotations as well as real hospital rotations. And as I said earlier, we, we uh, provide housing for free and meals for free. This is a map just to show some of the, uh, the drive distances between our clinics. Uh, so we found that our biggest challenge is location, 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 location. So what we have to really work in is recruiting, recruiting, recruiting. And so what we had to do is make this the most attractive place possible for a uh, physician to be by, uh, by having copious benefits, competitive salaries. And one of the things that Dr. Scuderi mentioned was the regulatory burden. We have an entire staff whose job is to reduce that burden from our, our physicians and our medical providers. We tell our physicians at one hire, you're here to practice medicine, not to practice business. So the business is the, is the side of our accountants. The, the physicians are responsible for take, doing the very best medicine that they see fit. Um, we have to have, we offer housing to our physicians at reduced rates. We have various bonus systems in place, we have very uh, student loan repayment options. And then we also, for uh, overnight hospital calls, one of the challenges to any system, we have an incentivized voluntary call program that has a waiting list. Back up one. Um, some other logistics we have is because of the, the distances that our, our patients have to drive, we have to make this a, a one-stop shop and a very efficient one-stop shop. An example of one of our goals as a patient for a, for a standard uh, return visit, we want them to be able to have standard labs like a CBC, CMP, and lipids, EKG, chest x-ray, their visit, and their prescription filled and out the door in less than one hour and we achieve that at least 80% of the time. Um, and that's because we have a very well-oiled system and a, uh, our own unique uh, electronic health record, which is ties in not just our, um, 
outpatient, but our inpatient, our emergency department, and our surgery centers. Um, we have smartphone apps where the patients can um, schedule their appointments. Vir they can have virtual visits for just a couple of different con conditions. Uh, they can uh, have a user smartphone app to re uh, call in their medication refills from a refill center. Um, they can get their lab results and also have a current medication list on the smartphone app. So once again, back to simplifying practice. Uh, the physicians that uh, work in our system uh, are told that their responsibility is high quality medicine. The uh, health system responsibility is the continuity of the system. So we work on billing collections, quality and accreditation. But uh, it's not that we, we see the physicians as the partners in that and they uh, help guide us. But the, uh, the nuts and bolts, the daily grind, we try to put that off on other people. Um, that's all I've got to say for now. I'm going to hand this back to Ann. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Hill and Dr. Scuderi. Um, those were two fabulous presentations, and I think we can see how varied primary care practices are across the country, depending upon where you are in terms of geographic location, your payer mix, um, you know, the staff you're able to recruit um, to your practice and the like. I did hear, though, a number of common themes. Um, you both are uh, innovating all of the time and you're using technology to really leverage um, your staff and to make care more patient-centered and, and um, more efficient. I also heard a plea um, to folks here in Washington and, and in state capitals to reduce the administrative burden that you, know, you are really um, it, it's very weighty and um, uh, it, it takes the fun out of medicine and is so time intensive. And then the other thing I think I heard uh, through both of your presentations is the importance of um, uh, really um, providing support to your staff and in all kinds of creative ways to recognize their contributions because it's it's not just a paycheck. Um, you know they. They, uh, it's very intense work. They work around the clock, and you, um, it seems like you're, you know, really rewarding them um, uh, in ways that are, go way beyond the financial to recognize their contributions. We have a ton of questions that have come in, and um, let me let me um, start going through these, and we we welcome um, all of these and more. So please continue to chat them in. First off, one of the things was. Um, uh, one of the comments was, "Can we clone these two docs um, and and bring them bring them to our our state?" Because I think people are very really very impressed with what you've been able to do. Um, one question we had for Dr. Sideri um, was, "You are getting information on the social determinants of health, um, and are you able to integrate that into um, the patient record?" Um, how difficult, you know, within EPIC, and how difficult would it be to gather reports um, to trend usage of the surveys and results over a period of time so you could really look longitudinally? So this is a project that we're working on now. It hasn't been activated. So our hope is that you, know, we, the patients are now able to um, fill out the review systems remotely prior to their visit. And so we're hoping that we could send them a similar survey that they're going to be able to do this and that it would auto populate at their visit because we're concerned we don't want to put any further burden on our MAs to fill out a survey online. They, they have enough to do a check in. They, they have so much work to do. And so we're working with our IT team now to see what the possibilities are. The other issue, way that we're looking at maybe is using tablets with the patients that check in to do it. Um, so it's a work in progress. It's, it's high on our list here in Jacksonville that we hope that we're gonna be able to do and do successfully. We've got a very good IT team here. Um, and, and the hope is that once we do that, we could build flow sheets with it and that it, it would work in Epic, but we, we haven't figured it out yet. It's, 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 it's our goal for this year. So we're, we're still early in 2018. So hopefully we, we can get this going, but um, I think it would be great to, to be able to see that. But the one thing that, you know, we're trying to stress is that we don't want to put any further burden on the medical assistants, that there's so much and the, and the providers that there's, there's so much work that's being put in at the visit that we need to have the information that's done by the patients that auto populates. So that way we're able to review it and it's not, taking further time away from the visit. 
Great. Um, Dr. Hill, anything to add to that, or we can go on to the next question? We can go on to the next question. Sure. So for each of you, um, what are your practices doing to encourage external providers and community partners to contribute better to really uh, up their game in terms of the care of, of your patients? Um, this is Dr. Hill here. As far as uh, one of the uh, challenges that I saw, and it's because I um, I oversee uh, our outside referral specialty that we don't have, and uh, a concern I had was when I would send a referral out to an outside specialist, and uh, uh, their primary their first visit would be done by a, um, um, a nurse practitioner, and a little concerned over you know. That you know, we had sent it from a specialist, and the, then the next step was to go to a, a nurse practitioner. So we uh, we we leveraged uh, uh, paying those visits uh, to make sure that that at least on the initial exam that they were seen by the specialist that they were <laughs> referred to. Dr. Scuderi, want to add to that, or should I keep going? Sure. You know, I, th I think a, a big part is just trying to, you know, one of the things is, you know, work for a bigger system is just asking the system to keep working with, you know, our payers on just making sure that they're valuing primary care and that they're, you know, trying to, for work that's being done well, for being a patient-centered medical home and for work that's being done above and beyond, that there should be extra reimbursement to do that because it takes, it takes extra effort and it doesn't happen automatically. Terrific. Um, this is a question for Dr. Hill. Um, I think there was a lot of interest in um, the way you're using technology. And one question was, how how is the physician and um, uh, compensated for um, you know the using that app? Um, is it RVUs? Is it how how does that exactly work? And are there bonuses in place for high performance? That's, we have a completely different. Uh, it's just when I hire uh, physicians come in the system, I just want I always have the conversation with them. You need to kind of rethink how you're paid. We have a livable wage uh, that's that's re based on MGMA average uh, for for the region, and we try to sit, settle in at the 50th percentile. And I assure the the physicians that that's going to be their uh, their base pay. Um, as far as we have a set number of patients we expect a physician to see, and as long as they're within reason of seeing that number, uh, they're compensated the same. Um, as far as extra compensation for virtual visits, those actually, the system is able to charge. Uh, we have something called a global billing rate, where we get uh, a global billing rate for all Medicare patients, regardless of, and Medicaid, regardless of level of care, we get the same billing rate, which includes labs, x-rays, and visit. So a virtual visit counts the same in our negotiations with Medicare and Medicaid. So it's, I guess the answer is that the system benefits, the provider benefits, they get credit for the visit, but we just have a completely different payout model. Mm -hmm. So uh, given that, you can be much more flexible in the way you deliver care. I mean, it, it, you're not so um, tied to any way, and it gives you that kind of flexibility and creativity. Um, so that's that's terrific. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, the next question is, uh, we we also uh, have a system in which we have a a, a bonus and a raise uh, policy. Once a year, we have a way of compensating our physicians to make sure we stay up, and also we reward longevity with longevity bonuses and uh, a compounding raise and all those things. I haven't had anyone uh, complain about our pace schedule, put it that way. That's great. Um, there are a couple of questions about um, getting patient input as you are um, uh, continue to innovate in terms of how you um, deliver care. One question was about, are you using any validated patient satisfaction tools? Have you thought about having patient advisors work with you, having some kind of ongoing um, input through a focus group or some um, patient advisory council or some other way to get patient input? I think this is a question for both of you. 
Sure, and um, you know at UF Health we're using um, we've partnered with Sullivan Llewellyn, and they have developed a survey for us. One of the issues that we had early on was the survey was too long, so we received a lot of feedback from the patients that they got tired of this. You know, it had ten many questions in it, so we've shortened it recently, hopefully to get more responses. And and I think that it's been a great tool to see what patients are thinking. It's you know a lot of times the feedback you get is is positive, but every now and then you'll you know you'll get some feedback from patients that you're able to make some changes. And I think that it it really helps us to see how we're doing and even compare month to month or year to year and see if we're improving or we're getting worse. Um, we have not tried a uh, patient advisory council. We, we talked about it a couple of years ago. It just never never took off. But one of the things I try to do is just our patients who have been here longest, I always check in with them and say, you know, we've grown. Do, do we still have the same feel? You know, is, is there things you would change? What do you like? And, and just really try to have that, you know, conversation with patients when they're here. And um, I, I think, you know, a lot of times we get great feedback, you know, on areas. But I, I think having it, you know, a patient advisory board would be, you know, beneficial, especially as groups grow bigger. I, I think it would help because a lot of times you have blind spots in your practice. Dr. Hill? Uh, we uh, use, uh, utilize HCAP scores and also an outpatient uh, tool. I don't remember the name of it, but uh, it's similar to uh, what Dr. Suderi uh, described. And then we also have, as for our residents, they have their own uh, uh, unique to the residency, their uh, patient uh, scores that they do as surveys, as well as those from the other staff. Terrific. Um, this is a question for Dr. S uh, Scuderi. Um, what are, how is the staff incentive set up for your team? You know, what's the criteria? How frequent? How does it work? Sure. So uh, if the clinic is, is profitable, so that if the clinic is, you know, uh, above a profitable state, then there's a shared savings plan that's determined, um, you know, by our compensation model. And then at that point, it, it's based on, um, we have to look at objective data. So most of the time it's based off of longevity for the staff. And so we try to, you know, you know, reward our staff that's been there longest. That's, that's probably the easiest way to do it without, you know, possibly being discriminatory on it. The other way you could do it is if you would set up a, a validated tool to, to judge the staff, but we haven't haven't gone that far. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we try to award the staff that's been with us the longest, and uh, I think they really appreciate it. It's something that's not guaranteed. It's, it's dependent on clinic performance, um, and I think it makes a difference. But I think even more than the bonus, I think just the events really make a big difference. I think just the little things go a long way. You know, just, you know, some Fridays we'll bring smoothies in, you know, and then get, you know, get smoothies for everyone. Little little things go a very long way with your staff. And, you know, we need to take time and just, just kind of take a pulse on how they're doing. And if the mood's down, um, you know, we got to number of Sono speakers in the clinic a, a couple of weeks ago and just having some music and letting you know, the different staff pick out the music for the day just brings people up. And so it's just small things go a long way, I think, if we're paying attention to our staff and really paying attention to the climate of the organization. Well, thank you both very much. I've just uh, seen that it is four o'clock and um, we have many more questions. We didn't really get a chance to um, answer. I just think that your presentations were so rich. It just generated um, even more questions to uh, understand your secret sauce. Um, before we ring off, we did have one request. Um, uh, Dr. Scuderi, can you um, let us know where that quote came um, from the end of your presentation? Because people found that very inspirational and very apropos for primary care. Sure. So. It, uh, well, I, I found it in a, in, in a book this week, so I will, I will share the book title, and it, it's very interesting. It's a book about innovations. I think it's an optimist guide to technology, but I have to get the actual book title for you. It was a sure. really interesting book about how uh, how to deal with technology and the challenges technology is bringing us in a, in a positive way. Well, super. We'll make sure we get that um, up on the website, and I, you also mentioned a journal article. The slides will be available, as will... Um, a recording of, of today's uh, webinar. So thank you both very much. It was really a very, very interesting and exciting and, and actually uplifting set of presentations. Um, and uh, we really appreciate all that you're doing out in the field and um, the innovation you're driving and the uh, excellent patient care you're delivering. So with that, um, let me call this webinar to a close. And um, uh, we thank you very much. Bye now. Thank you.